Have you guys ever wanted to 3D print something larger than what uh, a resin printer might be capable of doing? Or maybe you are prepared to break up a model and the sheer cost of the resin, the casting resin, is just too astronomical to stomach? Or is the model hollow? Or maybe you want it to be hollow and it just doesn't lend itself very well to SLA printing? Well, we might have a solution for you. We reached out to Polymaker and asked if they were willing to send us a spool of this stuff to try. This is a spool of their Polymaker cast. In a past video a very, very long time ago, we tried doing a lost wax, or rather lost PLA, versus the casting resin. Uh, I think we actually used Resinworks Violet in that video. Um, and the results were actually really good in favor of the filament. Now, the prints were not. Uh, don't go looking for that video, by the way, it's horrible. But it went a lot better than we expected. So when I saw that there was at all, you know, something that existed, a castable filament, I was really, really interested. So polycast is not PLA. It is made of PVB, or polyvinyl butyrol which is a thermoplastic, much like every other FDM printing plastic, um, but it is not actually commonly used because of its physical properties are, well, they're fairly poor, to say the least. It's not able to withstand ambient temperatures uh, in excess of 60 degrees Celsius, so it doesn't handle uh, UV and outdoor use very well. The area that it best excels at is the visual appeal. PVB is inherently transparent, so when you look at something, or if you're looking for something that looks like glass, you can look no further than PVB. Printing with this material is fairly easy. Uh, the nozzle temperature I used was 215 Celsius. The heated bed on my Prusa Mini was 75 C uh, with a maximum uh, with maximum cooling. So it's very, very similar to PLA in many ways. So it's not very difficult. It's not like a, a peak or, or, I don't know, ASA or ABS that requires special environment or anything. I tried making my own printing profile with some success, uh, just based off trial and error, what I was seeing, uh, but I eventually switched over to the Prusa Mint PVB profile and had a lot more success. It didn't take a whole lot. Again, it's very similar to PLA. I found a lot of issues printing with this at the much lower layer heights with a 0.4 nozzle. Um, I switched to 0.4 because, from my normal 0.6 rather because I wanted the details. And we ended up going up to, I think it was just 0.2, like a normal layer height. and. Uh, it worked out well. The lower I got, I found the more clogs I was getting. PVB, I found, was very cloggy. Uh, maybe it's an issue with my printer, but uh, I, I just found it mostly with PVB and almost nothing with PLA and PETG so far. Uh, probably the most game-changing thing that I mentioned about the transparency of this filament is what Polymaker calls their polysmooth process whereby they actually have a machine for this, but you don't need the machine necessarily, because I, I did it with some success, um, whereby the Polymaker machine dissolves, or rather ultrasonically mists or fumigates the parts with the alcohol that you put into it. Um, the alcohol that they want you to use is isopropyl. However, I didn't have any on hand. I had 95% ethanol or ethyl alcohol for cleaning my other prints on hand and it worked really well. Actually, it worked a little bit too well. A little bit more on that later. In a nutshell though, what the alcohol does is it clings to the surface, it turns just the surface, so all the print lines, into kind of a gel. It gets sticky and a little bit gross, frankly. Um, and it smooths everything out so that it looks like glass. I have two identical prints here. This one finished, this one didn't. It actually got a clog at some point. And uh, you, you can definitely feel the difference and visually see it as well. So in terms of, well, castability, this is a game changer because I would probably hesitate very, like, I would probably just not even try it, frankly, uh, casting a raw FDM print regardless of the layer height. So moving on into the actual casting side of what makes this work, supposedly. Obviously, we haven't yet tried it. PVB starts to combust at 450 Celsius, which 
uh, if you look at the numbers, PVB is definitely higher, but not astronomically more than a typical carving wax, or even PLA for that matter. These temperatures are well within the requirements for a normal wax burnout schedule, so there's really no reason for this not to work in theory. Now, there are other factors to consider, of course. Um, you know, how much thermal expansion are we going to have to deal with, and can the investment itself handle that interaction? Um, is there going to be a chemical interaction with the investment as well, or with the water? Is this going to absorb some of the water or swell? We don't know yet, but it's looking very promising on paper at the very least. We're not going to get too technical in this video about any of those other factors though. We just want to see what the results are. So something that I want to be very clear about before we start doing some close-ups and talking about the models, um, there is no reasonable way you can compare an FDM print to an SLA print in a jewelry context. There is just, it's ridiculous. I've actually printed um, a couple of models for comparison. This is the uh, open source ring that I did in Apply Labs Castable Cyan, which is this one up here. Love that resin. If you haven't tried a budget resin, casting resin before, best one we've ever tried. Uh, anyway, and then we also tried printing it in the PVB uh, at, I think it was 0.1 layer height with a 0.4 nozzle. Now, we could, um, you know, get a, a 0.1 nozzle or a 0.25. We could finely tune the machine. Um, CNC Kitchen actually did this recently with uh, an ultra small nozzle printing a very tiny Benchy. Um, now, something to note about that video though, uh, they also kind of compare SLA, which I think was really off track, frankly. Uh, the guy's machine is five grand uh, kit that you have to buy. You basically need like an engineering degree to put it together. It's an E3D tool changer. They are finely tuned piece of machinery that you cannot compare reasonably to, say, a Prusa Mini. They're, they're just totally different machines. Um, and SLA, when you just compare this type of quality, I can print, you know, 10 of these on my SL1S in an hour versus with a 0.1, you'd be spending eight hours per ring and the details would still not be very great. So anyway, this is not to directly compare the two. This is just to see how well the FDM stuff works in general for casting. Which is why I strayed away so much from doing small rings to doing larger objects, like this bracelet, for example, which came to us from Thingiverse. I'll have a link to that below. It is a great design because it's designed, A, for FDM printing. In other words, when you print it flat, you don't need any supports. Everything is, it's just beautiful, it works. And it's also a great contrast because Putting something like this on an SLA printer presents some challenges. This design is definitely not impossible for SLA printing. Um, it's actually kind of reasonable, but it would require some serious thought about print orientation and supports. And I mean, on the note of supports, this bracelet and a lot of these other large models, by the way, don't necessarily require supports at all. So you're using a lot less waste which on its face, of course, is great for the environment, great for your wallet, uh, and print time. Just overall, less supports is better. So in a nutshell, when the models start to get larger, FDM starts to look like a really good option. Now, this is not going to be the rule forever because SLA printing is starting to scale up. And if you're not already subscribed, you should be because we have a large format one on the way that we're very excited to show you. Um, it should be here probably in the next month or two. Something else to consider besides jewelry though is that with this FDM cast casting material, you can start to do other models that it would otherwise be impractical, such as this vase. Now this was designed for FDM printing and uh, the reason why I say it's not really good for SLA is because it's a hollow object. If I was to cut this, put it upside down as it would print, it would be creating a suction cup, basically. And that introduces a phenomenon called cupping, which can be mitigated by changing angles and all sorts of other tricks with holes and things. But again, FDM just lends itself really well. 
Now this is coming to us from Prusa Printers. This is the, I think it's Vor Veroni, please forgive me, I don't know how to say that one. Um, anyway, I'll have a link to it below, but it's a great model as is. I scaled it down to 60% uh, because of the sheer size of it. Uh, I want to be able to cast this in bronze as a hollow object. My setup is designed for jewelry, but it is by no means the standard. Um, it's a little bit larger than some uh, where they're just using a centrifuge machine. Those flasks need to be considerably smaller, um, actually about the size of this, quite frankly, the whole thing. My size is the step up from that where I can do maybe 30 rings at once with a vacuum machine, but there are foundries that are casting you know, full bronze statues. It's not unheard of to, do, to, to go larger. And there's no reason, depending on the machine you have, why you can't go full size, you know, body sized, if you wanted to with this type of filament. So enough uh, talking about this stuff. Let's get to its purpose. Let's try to cast this stuff. We're going to go and get our stuff sprued up, get it invested, and uh, we're going to do the burnout overnight using a normal wax burnout schedule using Plasticast from r, &R in our kiln. Um, it's going to be at least a 12-hour burnout, if not a little bit more. My prediction before we go anywhere is that this is going to turn out surprisingly well. Uh, my expectations when I saw this were like, eh. Then I saw the poly smooth. My expectations went up quite a bit. And after feeling it, handling the material, I feel like we're going to be pleasantly surprised. So let's go do that, and we'll be right back with those results. Okay, so we have done a cast overnight for Polymaker cast uh, filament, and we had some mixed results. However, the, the bad side, which I think we'll start with, uh, was actually my fault uh, in the sense that I've never really done this before, uh, and we tried doing a hollow vessel. As you can see, uh, the cast did not get all the way around, uh, and it filled up on the top. Now, ideally, what was supposed to happen is the metal gets poured in like so. The actual, like the core of the hollow vessel needed to be suspended and the metal go all the way around it. But what happened was in the burnout, the, um, the top, I guess the lip of the vase uh, wasn't strong enough to hold all of the investment, I suppose, making the core. And then what happened was it broke off, it dropped to the bottom, lent to get one against one of the sides and we got an incomplete fill now i've never done this before so that we had some issues was kind of inevitable if it had worked the first time it would have been awesome but that is not the case uh, anyway so this was a fail but we learned something from it and it's definitely something that you need to consider if you do go large something like these sculptures for example if you do a bust of a head, you need to make sure that your wall thickness is considerable and you have enough support. Uh, one of the tricks I've seen in foundry casting for said type of bronze castings is you actually put nails into the investment, or rather, I guess, the master, and you burn it out with the nails in place. The nails do create a hole in your final piece, but they hold the core, which is really the integral part here. 
Now, um, it is what it is. Uh, maybe we'll try this again. If you're not already following us on socials, uh, make sure you are because I might try to finish this up and uh, we'll make a, a bronze version. So anyway, we learned something. Now on to the good news. What did work? Well, we cast the bracelet and it is monstrous to say the least, uh, in a bet, in a good way. Now, the one that we didn't have a full complete print of, I still have, and then we have the cast. And uh, I'm pretty confident in saying that what we put in is what we got out. It doesn't have the, uh, the layer lines in the way that this one does. The chemical poly smooth process um, did a good job, but it really just made the surface ripply. Now, I didn't have the PolySmooth machine. Uh, PolyMaker, if you want me to look at that, send one over. Kind of interested. Um, anyway, the, uh, the surface is very ripply, so I would not consider this, um, unless you're looking for artistic type jewelry where texture is okay, I would not consider this a professional grade cast because there's just no way I can get in and clean a lot of these details. The surface texture is, it's almost integral. Like it's not a, it's not like a, a, a bond between the filament and the investment. It's not making a chemical reaction, which typically looks kind of like, like asphalt. Like it looks like a pothole almost. This is what I put in is what I got out, as I said. Now, something that's very um, interesting worth of note is that when you go to cast one of these models, something that you really need to consider is how much metal actually goes into the flask. Now, the typical way you do it is you weigh your model, which on this scale comes out to 20 grams. Now, when I weigh this, it comes out to 198, which let's see if it actually computes. There are methods where you can basically weigh your master, multiply it by a certain number associated with the metal you're casting in. For example, we cast mostly in silicon bronze. So the number for that gravity is 8.8. .8. So knowing that this is 20 grams, we can go 20 times 8.8 .8, and we get 176, which is a little bit shy of what this actually is. Now, what I need to consider when I print a, a castable filament is infill something we never talked about. Um, I, for this particular one, I think I just did 20% infill, or maybe it was higher. I, I can't remember exactly what my settings were, but it's fairly dense. And on the incomplete, I can definitely feel some uh, bumps and texture from the infill. So that infill is going to be leaving air pockets and holes that thankfully on this one, well, it didn't puncture into those air pockets and fill it with investment. Um, but it definitely skewed the results to what I should be able to weigh one to one. Um, it's close enough though that I think you could probably get away with just going one to one, but add about 20% on the end, 20-15%. It's typical practice when you do a casting that you add about 10% for the button. Now the button is this piece of metal on the back. You always want to have a little bit extra on top because the metal, even though fluid, does have weight and it pushes down and tries to help fill in all the gaps while the vacuum is pulling all around it. So I think it's a safe assumption that the button on this cast saved our, saved our butts, I guess. Um, and it was a success. Uh, I'm largely happy with the results. I was not expecting a jewelry quality as I have gone over before. Uh, earlier on in the video, this was not supposed to be a one-to-one -one comparison versus resin or wax. This is just an alternative, and my verdict is that the Polymaker cast material is a really solid choice, but you have to know what you're doing and why you want to do it. So you can get Polycast from Polymaker or off Amazon. Uh, I believe on amazon.ca it was 65 bucks for a roll of 750 grams which i thought i think it's really really affordable now relative to other filament that's about triple the cost so again all everything in context uh, if you want to get your hands on some check out the link below and check out polymaker if you haven't my impression of them is that they're a very premium company they know what they're doing and um, they will be there to 
gets you pretty much whatever you want. So that's all for this video. Thank you very much for watching. Um, like I said before, if you're not uh, subscribed to our socials, maybe check us out because I post a lot of these projects there finished that don't make it into the video. And um, if you are looking for help and you want to do something like this, uh, whether it's jewelry or sculpture, uh, consider checking out our membership program where you have access to me uh, through Discord on a more one-on-one -on -one basis, pretty much 24-7. Um, and you might also get a, a call from me to kind of go over your setup or whatever you might need. Anyway, that's all. I will see you guys in the next one.